In this introductory chapter, we'll discuss some of the basic terminology as it is applied to an analytical task, and you'll see some familiar terms from general chemistry as well as some new terms. It made sense to overlay the information from sections 1 and 2 in the same lecture, and I've listed the specific learning outcomes from each section here. I do this for every lecture so that students will have a clear list of the knowledge recall and ability level needed to be successful in the course. So be sure to refer back to these lists of learning outcomes as you prepare for different assessments in the course. Also note that any time a learning outcome begins with the word recall, that I'm expecting you've mastered or at least been familiarized with a topic in your previous general chemistry studies. I do not assume that students are familiar with any organic or other chemistries beyond general chemistry for the purposes of this course. The author opens the chapter with a vignette discussing cocaine use in Italy, which is interesting in and of itself, but he goes into depth with the task associated with developing a method for analyzing the amount of caffeine in chocolate. Let's discuss the methodology to familiarize ourselves with the general steps in an analytical process. Our first step in the analytical process is to develop a list of all the questions we might like to ask, such as, how much caffeine is in a chocolate bar? And, how does this compare to the amount of caffeine in other food products? You also need to think about the chemistry of the analyte in particular. In doing so, we see that chocolate bars also contain theobromine, a chemical precursor to caffeine. For this reason, a thorough analysis of caffeine in chocolate should also measure the amount of theobromine present as well. By developing good questions in the early planning stages, you can make sure that you're going after the information that will best satisfy your curiosity. Good questions result in good answers when the rest of the tasks are followed with care. Our next task consists of conducting a literature search. Has anyone done this before you? What was the scope of their study? What were their successes? What about their analysis didn't work so well? If the study you've proposed hasn't been done before, what in the literature can guide your process? How do you choose representative samples? How do you process the sample for analysis? What is the best method of analysis? You want to do your best to find as much information as you can before you head to the lab. This will save time, money, and certainly frustration in the long run. We need to decide what will constitute a representative sample. If the amount of caffeine in milk chocolate has previously been determined, Maybe we want to move on to dark chocolate or white chocolate. So of all the varieties of chocolate available, which we'd call our lot, we decide to choose a sample that is representative of dark chocolate. Note that this would exclude dark chocolate with almonds or nougat, which represent a higher degree of variability than if we choose to sample plain dark chocolate. Once we have chosen our representative sample, we need to prepare it in a state that is suitable for analysis. Not many instruments allow you to simply insert a solid sample and get a reasonable result. Rather, we have to take a heterogeneous sample composed of many different components and reduce it to a set of samples that is homogeneous. This is where that literature search should begin to pay off. In this example, we rely on the literature to tell us how many grams of chocolate will yield enough caffeine and theobromine to reliably be detected by the method of choice, in this case, a type of chromatography. To prepare the sample, we need to take care of any interference or components of the sample that would cause problems either with the instrument or the detection of the analyte of interest. To remove or extract the fat, the solid chocolate sample needs to be broken up into fine pieces. If this was a reasonably soft crystalline solid, we could grind the solid with a mortar and pestle to get finer pieces. What happens when you grind chocolate? The force and the friction of grinding a room temperature solid will cause it to melt into goo that will re-solidify if left alone. So now what? If we freeze dry the chocolate, the samples will become brittle enough that we can grind them into fine pieces, perhaps even a powder, that can interact thoroughly with the proper solvent to remove the fat. Next, we'll add a known quantity of chocolate to a centrifuge tube, which is a tube with a conical bottom that can withstand a large centri centrifugal force without shattering. 
We'll add a solvent to the chocolate powder, in this case, petroleum ether, and shake it to create a suspension of the solids in the solvent. After shaking thoroughly, the suspension is centrifuged, the solvent is decanted or poured off, and the process is repeated three more times. At the end of this step, we're left with a defatted solid residue that still contains the analytes of interest. Next, we want to quantitatively transfer all of the fat-free chocolate residue to an Erlenmeyer flask. This task is accomplished by adding pure water, heating, and stirring the mixture to suspend the solids into a mixture known as a slurry. This process is repeated until we're sure all of the solid has been transferred. To be able to compute the concentrations of caffeine and theobromine accurately, the same amount of water has to be added to each sample. In this example, the amount selected was 33.3 grams. Once the slurry was heated long enough to extract the analytes of interest, a portion was transferred to a centrifuge tube and spun to collect all of the solids at the bottom. The supernatant was withdrawn by syringe and filtered through a 0.45 micron syringe filter, which is a much handier filtration method than you're probably used to using. Ideally, all of the particulate matter that could harm the instrument is removed in this process, though a different pore size filter and filter material must be chosen based on the analyte of interest. For example, when I was analyzing for biological uranium products in groundwater, we had to move down to a 0.1 micron filter made of a material that would not bind the uranium during the filtration process. With this last little bit of sample preparation out of the way, we're finally ready for the analysis. We'll learn the finer details about chromatography at the end of the semester, so for now, I want you to be aware that chromatographic methods separate analytes based on their chemical affinity for functionalized silica surfaces. If you recall the discussions of intermolecular forces from general chemistry, you'll quickly see that a silica surface with a hydrocarbon molecule attached to it will be more similar to caffeine than theobromine because caffeine is slightly less polar. This means that our analyte solution will separate into two distinct bands as caffeine spends more time on the silica surface as we wash the column with a mixture of solvents to facilitate the separation and eventually wash both analytes off the column so we can measure them with a UV lamp and detector. The result is a chromatogram like the one pictured here. Initially, we'll want to inject the standards, or solutions of known composition, into the chromatographic instrument so we can ensure we're getting good separation of the two analytes of interest. That would allow us to see that caffeine elutes, or comes off the column, at about 7 minutes, while theobromine comes off much sooner, at 3 minutes. If we were to inject one standard composed of theobromine and caffeine, followed by an injection of our sample to see if both analytes are present, we would be performing a qualitative analysis. If, however, we inject a series of standards in a range of concentrations, this allows us to construct a calibration curve so that we can quantify the amount of each analyte present in our sample. If we compare the chromatogram from our sample, on the left, to our chromatogram of the standards on the right, you'll notice some differences in the baseline. In the sample, the baseline will not be as smooth due to other substances present. The baseline of our standards has the water dip characteristic of an injection of analytes in pure water. Using the area under the peaks for each standard injection, we can build our calibration curve. Typically, you'll take the data from each analysis and construct a scatter plot of the data points. Then you'll use the linear regression analysis in your spreadsheet software to generate an equation for the best fit line of the data. Finally, you'll calculate the concentrations of each analyte in the chocolate sample by using the peak height or some other value generated by the instrument to correlate the raw data to a concentration. This can be done using the equation for the best fit line or by eyeballing it as shown here. In order to judge the validity of our results, we need some quality assurance information to accompany the data. At a minimum, this usually means we calculate the standard deviation of the measurements. We'll discuss more robust methods of adding quality assurance data to our analysis later in the semester, 
such as by adding spikes to our samples to evaluate the recovery of the analytes using our method. Finally, we need to compare our data to available information so that we offer up at least a minimal interpretation of our results. How does our chocolate sample compare to other sources of caffeine in food? Did we answer all of the questions we started out with? Is further research necessary to answer lingering questions or new questions generated as a result of the analysis? You also need to address any limitations of the analysis. Did you have a small sample size? Did you limit your sample to only store brands? Did you encounter any analytical difficulties? One of the last steps will require you to write up your results in a manner that will be clear and understandable for the intended audience. Who is going to read this report? Is it another chemist, the general public, or someone in the food industry? This final step may or may not include the analyst. For example, when I worked in drinking water treatment, I was responsible for reporting the results, but the adjustments to the water treatment protocols was ultimately made by the engineers, not the analyst. Our results were also published to the consumers in the water district as mandated by federal reporting standards. For these reasons, it was important that the limitations and variability of our results were clear for the intended audience so they could draw their own conclusions.